right. Uh, welcome to this uh, deep dive session on um, ecosystems and watershed management and the technology that uh, could, should, would be uh, brought uh, to bear uh, to enhance the operations for water purposes in, in those two arenas. I'm Randy Fiorini. I serve as the chair of the Delta Stewardship Council. It's uh, probably one of the newest state agencies created about five years ago. And I'm partnering with Chuck Bonham, the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, probably one of the oldest state agencies in existence. Our, uh, our work together uh, overlaps significantly in the Delta. And as it relates to ecosystem management, uh, the topic before us today is something that is of utmost importance to both Chuck and to me. Now, I, I sat through most of the morning session and all of the afternoon session, and uh, one of the things I noticed is that much of the emphasis thus far has been on water deliveries and the challenges that the drought has presented for water agencies uh, in terms of quantity and quality. Um, we're going to talk about the sources of water today in this group. And I look forward to um, a, a, an on, a, a, just an ongoing conversation with all of you. Our job at the end of this hour is to report out the great ideas that were developed out of the conversation that we've had. So uh, we've got a couple of questions that have been posted that we'll use as a guide for stimulating your thoughts and your input. But I thought what I do uh, just to get things started is that I've heard Chuck say many times and from his position as the director of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, if he knew where the fish were and how many of them were there, he could, he could manage the system a lot better. So in terms of uh, the ecosystem, particularly as it relates to the Delta, where a lot of the water serving 25 million people comes from or comes through, a healthy ecosystem is, is required for a reliable water supply. So Chuck, in terms of technology, um, what's available out there besides the decades old technology that we've been using to identify where the fish are and how many? And what do you see on the horizon for managing the fisheries in the Delta? Let me make sure this Yes. Okay. Randy, it's a pleasure to be co-facilitating <laughs> with you. Uh, I want to start by saying I need y'all's help. Actually, I need more than that. Where I grew up, the plural of y'all is all y'all. So I need all y'all's help in thinking about application of technology in a faster, smarter, kind of Lee Major, $6 million man, stronger way both at an ecosystem level, which in turn should produce water supply benefit, water quality benefit, but also at uh, how we manage our biodiversity level. So Randy asks a great question relative to our fish species that are migrating through the delta and those that are resident to the delta. So either your salmon fish, who are born in fresh water, grow up in salt, and then swim back to their home river, or what's called our pelagic fish, which reside in the Delta. Right now, our department's been running, as its core monitoring effort in the Delta, trawls. We've been doing them longer than I've been alive. I won't tell you how long, but it's over 50 years. And we do them at different times of the year. And these are not surveys that, looking, that are looking for each individual fish they're taking samples at the same spot, same time of year, year after year, so we have a historical data record, and they reflect abundance. Incredibly invaluable information, but may not be the data set I need on a Monday at 5.30 p.m. when we're trying to figure out how close the Bureau of Reclamation can turn a wheel or our state Department of Water Resource can open a gate. I have less ability to turn to some flow of information and know instantaneously 
where any of those fish may be at a given moment. That's where we've got to get to. Because what we're finding in water scarcity times is exploiting that margin of flexibility between supply and ecosystem is how we run the systems more finely at a instantaneous scale, good for the ecosystem, good for people. So there are a couple of things in the works. Right now, we take a percentage of the fish we raise in our hatcheries and we put a tiny little tag in their snouts. And when they come back, hopefully, uh, three or two years later, we take a percentage of the fish and we, we chop their noses off and we record that data that's coming out of the transceiver in their nose. What we haven't done yet is mark them such that we know instantaneously as they're alive, moving their presence absence. Another technology that's on the cusp is something called the smelt cam. So the USGS, Geological Survey, and our department are testing a pilot where we would drop seine nets in the water not to pull the fish out, which is what we do now, and can have uh, incidental impact to the species. We put them back, but the pulling out and counting, you know, fish like to be in the water, not out of the water. We're toying with the idea of using the seine to funnel the fish through a, basically a fulcrum and plop a cam. And trans, you know, move ourselves into that system rather than physically handling these fish. So those are two examples of things we're trying to do in the Delta uh, to improve the management of these fisheries, basically on this hypothesis. If we know more about them and at a more instantaneous basis, we can make smarter decisions uh, relative to the two really large uh, water projects, the federal Central Valley Project and the state, state water project. Mostly, though, I need your help. So I view today, the next hour, as a chance for me to get out of my office <laughs> and ask you, the experts. We've got 6,400 species in this state. Uh, we own and manage a million acres uh, at the department. If you've got a great idea, let's figure out how to test it and run it out and see if we can put it in play, because we desperately are lagging behind the use of technology to benefit our ecosystems. I agree. And um, we have Ava on my right, Kyle on my left with the microphones. Um, you've heard one example of, uh, of technology applied to the ecosystem, water quality, water temperatures, as it relates to the watershed. We've got a, a number of things uh, uh, potentially to deploy up there. But I agree with Chuck, we want to hear from you. So uh, what technologies can help improve uh, management of our ecosystems, in your opinion? And if you don't come forth with anything, I have more yeah, questions for Chuck. It's a long hour. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot going on in this field. But frankly, I'm not seeing enough of it come to me fast enough that we can flip it into deployment and really increase the pace of using technology for management decisions. Filling the space, I'll give you another example. Uh, we know that in the winter, when it starts to rain again, the first big rain events are going to push out a ton of sediment from all the tributary systems and into the delta. And what can happen is, we call it a sediment plume. You'll see a, a bloom of sediment, literally, and then that bloom will grow in size, and it tends to typically start in the north or central delta. And if it spreads to the south of the delta, the very little fish that are most imperiled actually like the turbidity because they can hide from the big fish that want to eat them. So the little fish get into the turbidity sediment and they end up actually heading south towards the pumps of the very large water systems. 
which turns out isn't very good for their health, right? <laughs> so just this past winter, we did way more active instantaneous management of both pumping from the south delta and managing reservoir releases to reduce the risk of turbidity, that bloom, that bridge spreading. It turns out we may not be trying an even smarter technology, which is aerial overflight and figuring out how to map sediment from overhead into a GIS database and then having kind of this modeling mapping tool that can project how it may move. And I'm thinking this because I'm just coming off dealing with the oil spill in Santa Barbara and it turns out NOAA on the federal front has some really cool oil dispersant modeling tracking systems Sometimes it may not be we need a new technology. We just need innovation in the marketplace or we need linkages between uh, another part of the conundrum transporting the technology in. My comment, I think you can hear without the mic, but uh, comment is that you mentioned aerial, but also turbidity measurements in situ at a few sample buoys or something would take care of uh, getting you at least the correct data model done. So not only you would uh, measure from air for gross turbidity, but you would get particulate picture uh, sizes of sediments, etc., and also aerosol kind of micron size particle in the, which would be more monitorable at the mouth of the delta. Yes. So. I think to condense the comment, what I'm hearing is, uh, don't forget you have a whole suite of attributes you could be collecting more real-time information on. So what I'd flip back to the group is, uh, how? Because often I hear as a barrier from different communities, we can't afford it. What does it look like to put a monitoring array across a natural system such that you can get the data? And I'm totally open to any advice y'all have on how to bring down the barriers in that context as well. Sir, I came late, so my point of request is, are you also going to deal with watershed recharging technologies in this session? Yes. We Good. Can do whatever Good. we all want to Good. talk about. So whenever it's the right time, I have a couple of questions. Let me know. Great. We'll follow up on the monitoring uh, comment first. Yes. My name is Ajay Goel from Department of Water Resources. I manage the Service Storage Investigations Program, the System Reoperation Program. Before this, I used to manage a project called Frank's Tech Project, which involved installing a gate in Three Miles Slough. Three Miles Slough connects San Joaquin to Sacramento River. And the thought we had at that time, if we have a barrier that, I mean, operable gate, that operates based on tidal cycles, we could, normally the net, out, net flow from Sacramento goes into San Joaquin. And if we see there is a turbidity plume in Sacramento River, and we, want, we don't want it to go inside the delta, then what we would do is operate the gate such that the flow in San Joaquin would increase and would push towards Sacramento. We could operate it both ways and tailor the fish or direct the fish out to Chips Island. So that's one way we think we could uh, help direct the fish out. And regarding his question of um, stations, I used to manage uh, in, um, maintenance of stations in the Delta, water quality stations, 14 stations in the Delta. And those stations have turbidity monitoring devices on them. So, and they are real time sent over to CDEC. I don't, I don't want to get too far off topic here, but um, the idea of how much it costs always starts out a conversation and tends to chill it. And sometimes we need to find a way to engage the community first and everybody getting to the same understanding of what the problem is. And there's a lot of new technology that's now used for public engagement that takes good analytics and pulls all the data together. We did a little bit of this at USDA for the open planning rule, for the forest rule. 
and getting everybody to first see and go, aha, that's a problem, and then see what they can do from where they are to help solve that problem instead of just starting with, we need more monitoring, oh, we're going to spend money for that, and not making that connection. It's the human culture activity of that. And when I think about this topic, anything we could do to get engagement and shared understanding to try to diminish the um, confrontational aspect of doing these kinds of projects would be huge. Well, and so in an earlier chapter in my life, a few folks and I were working on the idea of watershed collectives, meaning you, you try to find those places where use of water creates tension. There are very many equally valid beneficial uses of that scarce resource, and you've got high biodiversity or you've got a natural resource thing you're trying to manage to. And I have found in those watersheds, actually, <clears throat> when you use the technology to foster kind of an understanding of where everyone's coming from, you've got a really cool opportunity to deploy technology because a lot of times on the ecosystem side, we're not asking for all the water all the time, which is a misimpression the consumptive use side may feel. It turns out, actually, sometimes for the fish, you may just need a little bit more water on Tuesday through Thursday in August for two weeks. And then when you get down to that problem solving, you realize, well, we don't know how to know if there's enough water on this 100-foot stretch of riffle. And there's a technology out there called pressure transducers. And you can actually network a riffle in a stream with a pressure transducer and link it back up to the grower's system and then if everybody in the watershed's kind of agreeing, they're collectively managing to that spot, almost as if they've unionized themselves, uh, you can get some really cool outcomes. You're thinking more about what matters the most for the fish. You're not trying to ballpark, oh, we'll use the USGS gauge, which is eight miles downstream on a different confluence, because it's the only measurement point we've had for 50 years. You're actually thinking about what matters to the 15 people that live around that tributary creek, and they want that often, too. So I think you're exactly right, Secretary. You know? My name is Tito Sasaki of Sonoma County Farm Bureau. Uh, fish habitat has many types of threats, and uh, one that you mentioned is the uh, influx of uh, sediment, that's very interesting. In our area currently, the uh, major threat is the lack of uh, in-stream flow. And uh, we are trying to do the best to uh, improve the chance of fish survival. But has there been any sort of organized research activity in your department to come up, develop uh, so, some kind of a habitat design that uh, sort of a, can, where the fish can survive with a lesser amount of water? Because, uh, you know, there could be some way to alter the stream bed configurations or stream configuration itself. Uh, in the case of a drought emergency, that so that the uh, chance of fish survival could be increased. Is there any such uh, activities going on? There's a whole world of professionals who are fish biologists who practice in the sub-area of in-stream flow methodology. It will put you to sleep in about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, what is lacking in my experience, Tito, is how you take the hydrology biology scientist and you help their work product be displayed in a visual mapping GIS modeling sense so the common party water user who has good intentions to benefit the ecosystem can speak to the very techno kind of geeky driven hydrologist fish biologist. I happen to think we're missing sometimes the technology hub, if you will, that can help the various 
outer parts of the bicycle, I'm trying to come up with a, a metaphor here, kind of communicate with each other through some tool in the middle. And what I'm finding more and more in ecosystem management is that tool is often some sort of GIS visual mapping, something that allows people to look at a situation displayed in a map base and then the parties can say, well, if we did this, what happens? And they can look back at the visual display and see how it may change. And then they go over and they twist it again. They see how it may change. Because it's the gaming of ideas through like these tools that then turns into the decision making that gets you to the better result, if that makes any sense. But or I may just be blabbering on. These tools require a lot of underlying lying correct modeling. If I may interject. It's true. Because it's not just the IT kind of tool. It has what kind of a C phase modeling, what kind of flow modeling, CFE modeling, whatever it takes. Just one thing, right? Let me, let me add, add to this. Um, a month ago at UC Davis, uh, a three day workshop was held on integrated modeling for the ecosystem. It was sponsored by the Delta Stewardship Council the Delta Science Program, and the National Science Foundation. And it was amazing. Uh, Chuck's right. I mean, there's some pretty geeky things when you, when you get to the computer models and the uh, algorithms and, and this. But um, one, of the, one of the problems that we have, we have great models for this or for that or for the other thing, but we have very low integration. And so that was what the, the workshop identified as the single biggest technological need is to find ways to combine these great models into one integrated model then to do the kinds of things that, that Chuck has described. I was one of five panelists and I was a little intimidated um, because I'm just a farmer. So I thought, well, what could I contribute to this? Just and and, and I, I, my, I have a passion for aviation and I remembered when NASA began to uh, scale down their efforts to do suborbital flight, there was um, uh, the ANSI X Prize, uh, a, a private uh, funded uh, prize to incentivize new technology to uh, in, um, encourage suborbital flight. And I think it was a $10 million prize and uh, Bert Rutan, a Cal Poly graduate, uh, uh, was successful in, in achieving the, the conditions that were set forth for the prize. So I offered to this workshop on integrated modeling, uh, help me present to the X Prize people the need for a uh, prize for integrated modeling of ecosystem management in California. And uh, I, I, some took me serious, I was serious. I had already phoned it in and offered it up as a, as a, a suggestion. but. I mean, it really is at that level of need that we have to, to be able to understand and manage our systems. So, Which is the second question on the screen up there, right? And for y'all in the private sector, I mean, you can't forget when it comes to ecosystem natural resource management, you're interfacing with uh, government, right? And this is my first job in government, so I say this lovingly but with you know some candor bureaucracy isn't limited to government of course bureaucracy is defined by largeness that can happen in the private sector as well but to really move a needle in ecosystem management technology is going to have to come from somewhere but then it's going to have to get integrated into a department like mine and pull my department into a modern century in order to really then make the difference, uh, which is out at the biodiversity landscape le level. It's not going to be like some of the other panels today, which were if you do the technology, you get increased quantity. Or if you do the technology, you get improved quality. Because we're playing for the technology equals this result, which will produce that effect. So we've got another layer of, I don't know if it's the technology causation chain phrase I just made up. So. 
We have two in the queue. We've got uh, um, speaker yeah, back my here, and then Maury, you're next. My name is Donna Begay, and I'm uh, formerly a tribal chair with the Tubata Labels in Kern Valley. I currently now work for the State Water Resource Control Board. Um, I, I often look at the science here and the water technology, and I think about the tribal ecological knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge, and it's really important that we not drift away too far from that. And I think what was said earlier about working with local surrounding communities is most important. If anything, to capture the ethnography of today, of what people know about their surrounding watersheds and how they would see uh, protecting and addressing these issues. I think it's most important to hear it from the community. I've worked with my own tribe and we recently implemented a, a water project on uh, two of our allotments and we were very fortunate, but we were considerate of the ecosystem. We were considerate of what the water is required for, for not only the people, but the plants, the animals, and downstream neighbors. And, and that's important to know, you know, how much to take, how much to use. And especially now, I mean, it's so important. Uh, one important other aspects of technology is a collaboration in working together like with U.S. Forest Service, in the, in the Dunlap tribe over in the in the Dunlap area there just east of Fresno studying like the Kings River area in the high meadow restoration areas and and doing core sample studies of the soils and partnering with the tribes to get their perspective of that history what is the soil study saying what is the current science saying about the past in regards to the soil studies. And you, you'd be surprised what the tribal folks will come up with because they know when there was a last big burn. They know when the harvest of fish in that area was good. They know when they were able to make abundant baskets because there was plenty of deer grass. And that's what the soils indicate often is that this is, this is the pattern of evolution of, of our planet in that area. So I just want to kind of reinforce how important that is to continue to do that, not only the community today, but the community that's been around for a very long time. Great, and, and it, it goes to the, the genius of those uh, Wade and those folks that organize this, providing the opportunity for people with hands-on experience to advise us so that we can report back good ideas. So thank you for that. Maury? Yeah, I'm Maury Ruth with the Department of Water Resources. Uh, coming back to uh, new technology, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in connection with the... Okay, that's better. I'm wondering, uh, in connection with the problems over at Shasta, you know, whether your department would consider the cloud seeding project that has been proposed by PG&E uh, the big aquifers that feed the base flow there have been uh, decreasing. Maybe it's about half full now. And sure. The, uh, the uh, base flow has dropped off a thousand to thirteen hundred CFS, mm -hmm. and they had proposed a cloud seeding project to restore the, the aquifer. Yeah. And we are looking for support. Uh, fishery agency support. Yeah. If I had no. I don't think I have an opinion on cloud seeding, Maury, but I'd be glad to chat with you about it. Part of it strikes me as the old adage which brought folks west to begin with around reclamation anyway, which was the rain will follow the plow. Not always the case. Um, I do think your idea has strong fundamentals. Set aside the tactic. In my experience, and this relates to um, the chair's comments a minute ago, we're not yet ready, even though we've identified our greatest reservoir is our natural landscape at high elevation, which is why with the governor's leadership, his water action plan tells my department to restore 10,000 acres of degraded meadows in the Sierras and Cascades because if you can restore the natural function to those meadows, you may slow water down, you may let it percolate and recharge, and this is the connection to integration. The Forest Service has a good sense of where a lot of that work needs to be done. Here's where we're not ready with technology on this endeavor. I believe in the hypothesis. 
there's some good literature out there. But we're not ready to say if you do 10 acres here in this tributary, five years later, your aquifer will have recharged this percent or your downstream confluence point will have DO, dissolved octacin, changed in a better way. We're not yet networked, but we should be thinking about our use of funds like Proposition 1 funds such that you do the restoration and apply the technology and the monitoring so that we're setting ourselves up to make the case in the next go around for the next innovation leap. So that's me trying to put a lot of thoughts together. So I'll, I'll sleep on cloud seeding, but sign me up for like high elevation aquifer recharge kind of. Maury, I, I, I served on the Turlock Irrigation District Board for 16 years, and for all 16 of those years, I voted affirmatively for cloud seeding in the Tuolumne River Shed. Um, you know, at the end of the 16 year period, when I look back, it may have made a one or two percent difference as it compared it to the Merced River or the Stanislaus River watersheds. Uh, and it was always dependent upon cumulonimbus clouds, of which in a year like this, we didn't see many. So um, I'm on record as having voted to spend money to do it, but um, I'm uncertain as to uh, how much bang we got for the buck ultimately. Yeah, in this case, somebody else is willing to spend the money with some support so that it's a good idea to do that. Mm -hmm. Next question. Right there. Uh, hello, my name is Mary Simmerer, and I'm the uh, sustainability coordinator for the Department of Water Resources. And I think this is a very important conversation, but I would like to go back to uh, what the woman at the back said about uh, ecological knowledge. I think before we know the technology we need to get us where we want to go, we need to really have a good understanding of what is a healthy ecosystem. Uh, these boundaries are really fuzzy. Um, I've heard a lot about fish management, but uh, there's a lot more species out there. <laughs> and what may maximize fish uh, habitat may come at a cost. And so I think probably one of the more important things as a state is to have a sense of what is this healthy ecosystem we're after and how are we going to achieve it? And then we'll have a better idea of what technology is necessary. Uh, for what it's worth, just personally, I don't think we can engineer our way towards every result we may want as a society. Uh, and you, know, you can't forget your past or you'll never truly figure out where you want to go. So I, I agree, there is some synergy between technology and innovation combined with a real deep understanding of the ecology we're trying to have in a balanced system. Wait, do you have a comment you want to make oh, now? Or? I want to be in the queue. You're in the queue. Okay, you're number three in the queue. To my left and then to my right. But, one, one additional thought, sorry to dominate. You know, a thing that's really emerging is environmental DNA. What we're finding, and we're, we've got a partnership with the genomics crowd down at UCLA, we don't totally understand, let's take fish out of it, Amar Amarosa vole or monarchs or some of these real obscure endemic species in the state, uh, tidewater gobies and abalone are another example, at a, like a true genetic sense related to climate change. I mean, we're off topic from water technology. Uh, but there's a lot of growth in the environmental DNA field. And to take my earlier smelt cam idea, so we, we kind of move off of just trawls and handling fish, we move towards a smelt cam. Maybe we move towards a smelt cam and something that allows us to know environmental DNA as a species is moving past a monitoring point. That'd be pretty cool. Okay, I'm Lewis Muller with the Department of Water Resources, but in a, well, and, and it seems like to be, <laughs> yeah, we Stack really love crowd. fish, I guess. At any rate, in my former job with the Water Board and right in this room, we did a lot of water right hearings on fishery issues. And, and in one of them, 
I have I am reports that came in and stuff, but the biologist basically had a photograph of the stream at different stages, and that became the most the best testimony we had to basically set what needed to be done in that stream. And that comes back to kind of what you were saying about mapping, but photographs of the stream in that that critical riffle and stuff like that actually can be very informative of it. The other thing I wanted to say is that I also noticed, and I took training in IFIM, and it was a methodology, and it was something that involved a little bit, It's the way it's being deployed, it seems like it's done more like the scientists go out and do the study, but it was intended to be more of a methodology where you engage with the public. And I think that if we got back to more of that public engagement in those kind of studies and brought that back in, you could bring in the tribal perspective and you could bring in other kinds of the fishermen's perspective as well into that. The second thing I wanted to say is when I went out fishing the other year, because I'm not poaching this year, but when I was out there, um, I had forgotten my fish. I had bought a one-day fishing license. Full of what you tell me. I know. <laughs> I didn't get pulled over, luckily, that day. But I was thinking, I was out there with my, should I put the pole in or should I just put it away? I brought up my permit on the phone, which got me to thinking that if you had the fishermen actually taking photographs of their catch and reporting it through their phones, that might be a way to get more information on what's being caught in a more real-time way. But so let, um, again, I'm a little bit off of water, but to the extent I'm in the safe zone of technology and ecosystem management, get a load of this. So we manage all the commercial fisheries in the ocean, right? And the way it works is boats are licensed, there's harvest quotas, they go out and catch them. They're required to, when they get to the dock, give our scientific aides a landing receipt, it's in paper. So we collect it all up and down the coastal ports and then we put it in a spreadsheet. And of course, every staff spreadsheet doesn't interface with the other staff's Excel spreadsheet. And you got hundreds of years of this information. And then about six months later, we get around to kind of processing through it and going back to the fleets and saying, well, last year we could catch 100. This year we think it's going to be 150. It's 2015 for crying out loud. So again, with the governor's leadership, we're about two years into trying to flip every commercial fleet towards uh, tablets on board. As soon as they hit reception coming back to port, they're uploading information. And we're on our backside trying to create a computer system model that'll take it all in and allow us to start managing the stocks literally day by day. And this is called risk pool management, moving boats off of pressure spots and then back onto them because you're moving information instantaneously. Same thing can work in water for species. I'm going to go to the far right over here, and then uh, when you're finished, you can hand your microphone off to Wade. He's been waiting patiently over there. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Gia Schneider with Natel Energy, and I have a, just going back to a couple comments earlier, um, or a couple comments ago, with respect to the high mountain um, meadow restoration work that you're doing, and the point that you raised, that it would be really wonderful to be able to know what the state is now and five years from now actually have objective tools to understand if objectives were achieved, right? And, and understand where, where maybe you overachieved or underachieved because from that we can actually learn because we shouldn't fool ourselves that we actually know <laughs> exactly how to achieve all the outcomes we want or even which are the, exactly all the outcomes we should try to be achieving at this point in time. And the ground's going to continue to shift under our feet with climate change. So. Um, so I'm curious because we're working on a tool. We're coming at it from a, we've come at it from a little bit of a different angle, but we've ended up in exactly this space of how do we look at for in our focus is watersheds. How do we look at uh, designing and then implementing and then monitoring over a long term projects that will then have a number of impacts within a watershed? And there's and it is 2015, and the technology we can bring to bear on it is is pretty amazing actually, and is is the pace of change of that technology is accelerating pretty fast. So areas that were, were 
So you, can, you start with a simple mapping in GIS, you integrate in sensors, we have tablet deployed um, site survey tools which enable us to actually get in, input from folks who are out in the field. Um, if you get those in the hands of local community folks, you can now start to recruit those people to give you uh, regular inputs. It's all, at the end of the day, all the information is just georeferenced time series. Some of the time series are very frequent, some of the time series are very infrequent, but at the end of the day, it all fits in that common framework. And then if you start to integrate in the fact that we're moving towards the ability to have relatively frequently updated satellite imagery of one to three meter type resolution, now you can start to think five years from now, if I start actually monitoring and gathering that data today, I can start to do some really, again, these are hypotheses that need to be totally, need to be proven out over time and the value of that imagery in terms of being able to deliver true real monitoring outcomes is still to be proven. But you can start to imply, okay, if I see these changes in my, ima in my imagery over time and I'm taking a satellite imagery of that same spot every day or every week or every month, that starts to become very powerful. So my, my question to you is who um, should we talk with? <laughs> because we're, it, it, it's a very live project for us right now. Um, again, we're coming at it from a very specific angle on the energy side, but we've ended up in this in where actually what, we've, what we're creating has, we think, some pretty interesting value from the monitoring perspective uh, overall. Well, let me think about it and chat with you afterwards. Have you heard of the Landsat mission? Yeah. yeah. It's not, I mean, the idea of big, broad temporal spaces and then mapping and tracking over time. Uh, it, it, it is only the year 2012, I think, that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has its first ever division of technology. So, we, you know, we're, we have infrastructure challenges to be ready for these kinds of things. Um, but I can think of a few people, maybe we'll, we'll give you some names for some networking and kind of put parties together. No, this, I this, can, uh, just, can, just a minute. It is very related to the topic. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something and then you can proceed. This brings up a, a, a question that I've always had. There are a lot of good ideas out there. What's the portal in state government for receiving these, these good ideas? Now, clearly not every idea is going to be good, and there needs to be a way to filter it, but there also needs to be a depository. And the question you have asked the department director is the same kind of question that, that pervades our, our state government. So um, I just offer that up as an ongoing question for thought. Wade, maybe it's another uh, summit someday. Well, you know, we have these overlays, right? We have California Technology Agency. Each department has a direct deputy director, each agency. So this is a really good conversation, I think, for the state to take from this dialogue and think about um, portal identification and, you know, receptivity and kind of movement of ideas between the state family writ large. I'm going to, no, I'm very, very happy that the lady spoke before me because it set the stage for really answering her concern. First, if I may, with your permission. In 1972, I selected the spectral bands that went on what was then called ERTS-1 and 2 satellites for NASA, which later on became the Landsat series all the way through. Then we also worked in part of my work at Goddard, that was at NASA headquarters. Part of my work at Goddard Space Flight Center concerned the design and development of three satellite systems called Terra, Aqua, and Aura. These are in roughly the same orbits as the Landsats were, and they give out today data each in excess of one terabyte per day. The data is processed in various data sets and is available through NASA portal. What is available is the raw data form. Somebody has to massage it into application oriented, like this meadow area, that many repetitive overviews. Uh, and I am talking to people who are managing this program at Goddard to say, now with more satellites coming, give angular views as well at sunrise, at sunset, how do these meadows look? How much have they generated? This is meadows. It could be same as water moisture 
in the soil or it could be water flow in small streams and rivers. Now, this is just an answer to her, but my and, question still remains. Oh, you have a question. Okay, well, I was going to say, you should get together with Jeff yes, afterwards. Yes, I am. I am. Okay. I'm going to. Okay, I'll we'll definitely exchange contact. Second question is, again, as you might have noticed, we are, we are here for like half a century in this country. We were immigrants from India. My brother, Dr. Govind Sharma, has spent 40 years as chair of Natural Resources and Environment Department at Alabama. He asked me a question. Ask the local tribal folks, why did they not move west of the Sierras towards the plains? Was it earthquake? Was it changing drought or other climatic knowledge they had? Why did they not move too much to the west of Sierras? I could not answer him. But I have some experts who might be able to answer that question. He is concerned about drought. So that was the comment. The, well, the, the question that I am, that the topic that I am most interested as a scientist and engineer is what are the technologies that will replenish our watershed, especially when people like that have monitoring systems ready for measuring that. How deep are we going? How many years we took to deplete? How we can replenish? We will pay. Somebody will pay if you can show the right effect. Let's see if we have some technological uh, suggestions. I think Wade Thank you is... for allowing me this big discourse. Yeah. I have Apollo Award from NASA. Thank you. Glad you're here. So I'm allowed to speak on this topic. You're allowed to speak without those credentials in this room. <laughs> So for the last couple of years, Chuck and I have obviously been attached at the hip in terms of drought response. So I've, I've gotten a real education in just how vexing some of this ecosystem management is in the drought. And of course, Randy presides over an agency that is trying to understand the science of you know, the most contentious uh, area of water use in the state, of course, the Delta. So my question, well, and I should say that as we were putting this uh, summit together, this was the sort of the breakout session that didn't look like any of the others because we've been inundated with companies that want to sell technologies for ag efficiency or, or industrial efficiency or even residential, but not so much for ecosystem management. So the question I asked is, is this really a technology program or a technology problem, I should say? And Joe Grindstaff's comments at the last plenary were interesting. He said, you know, that he, you know, in some respects, there's less uh, stream flow management than there has been at least um, those streams in part measured by the federal government as a result of federal government cuts. So I guess my question for you is how much of sort of effective ecosystem management can be accomplished with adequate funding and more sort of ubiquitous deployment of the technology we already have versus how much of it is really needs new technology or new methodological approaches? Both. In my experience, it's both. And I don't think I could reasonably put a percentage around it. I think we need to pick up the scale of investment and employment of current technology. USGS is a good example. You know, the 300 gauges that are going away need to stay and you probably need to double that. But before you came in, I also said on the gauging, I thought if we just stop at relying on hardwired static gauges in the historical spots they've been, we're not going far enough. Sometimes we need to gauge a stretch of creek between you and me with new technology that hasn't reached a price point yet that can be deployed easily by a, a regular farmer, like a pressure transducer. Technology, I think, can help us bring down the cost barrier by creating the next generation of those products. I will tell you, though, the other thing I think is, this is personal opinion, all the great brands that are working on technology to apply in these other sectors come work on technology as it relates to ecosystem management. I don't, in my experience working with colleagues around the state, there are few yet willing to jump into the natural resources world and try to do there, either at a 
a business model disruption level, like jumping into the taxi world and creating Ubers, doing something that's different at a mo business level, or come in with a technology that no, like nobody knew we wanted an iPad until we were presented with the opportunity to have an iPad. I don't know what the iPad equivalent is in the ecosystem, but we need people to come into this field. It's starting a little bit, I'm finding, with like the Palantirs of the world, because so much money is being spent in the Gulf after Deepwater Horizon, and nobody had thought about how do you spend $10 billion for ecosystem benefit and manage the data around that. So I think we need to do more of the capacity growth. We need to persuade more of the best and brightest to get in this field. And then there's probably some technologies we, don't, we aren't aware of yet. We're waiting for the iPad. That's my personal view. And, and so Wait, I would, I would piggyback on those comments. I, I, I think the, the complexities that exist in the Delta are, are, the, are the greatest part of the challenge. And I, I have the privilege, you are correct, in working with some of the greatest scientists in, in California in, in, on ecosystem and, and uh, water-related science uh, issues. I visited with them in preparation for this, and they told me, number one, the real-time sensors exist that it can be connected either via cell or satellite. And that needs to be expanded very thoughtfully, but it needs to be expanded throughout the system. Then the data collection that occurs, um, we had a big data summit uh, three or four months ago and identified um, some of the key problems re associated with data. It comes in different forms, in different languages, uh, in, in utilizing uh, different means to, to achieve the data. So there needs to be a synthesis of the data. And then the third step is to put it in a platform that, of open architecture that can be accessed by all the, all the scientists that are interested in that particular issue. Uh, and we're, we, see, we see movement in that direction, not as rapidly as we would like, but... Um, uh, I, I think technology is going to play a huge role in not, nece not necessarily solving our problems, but helping us to manage them. Take a step further, now we're in the philosophical, though, because one of the things I struggle with sharing, maybe overly sharing with you all today, <laughs> you know, when you think about technology, I think most of us have a sense that it's, it's occurring in part related to the movement in a, like a market economy, right? There's some motivation that is related to profit, which is fine. And somehow that's translating into entities trying to innovate. Well, over in this field, natural resource management ecosystem, you know, like the, philo, philosophically, I guess, the, the, the profit is public, there's a, it's a public benefit good. So I'm all... I'm always like, how do you get the same energy and uh, intensity that's going on in the private sector translated over into these topics? Secretary Ross, I don't know if you had a thought on that. Go ahead, Karen, and then we'll move over here. Because that's what I had my hand up for. And I don't want to sound crass, but th this is exactly the thing. We, for years, didn't really truly understand the environmental impact of what we're doing, and so we've never really tried to monetize it in a way. And in Australia, they put a lot of money so that environment could buy, could buy water, and then all of a sudden there's new ways of managing it. We haven't put it on the same equilibrium, so some people resent it, sorry, but some people do. I'm not one of those. I want to be very clear about that. But we haven't put it on the same footing and... And people don't have to see making money in it, but I think about the next generation that's coming out of schools today. They want to have a purpose in life. They want to solve problems. They do want to disrupt things. But if they have never been exposed to this kind of thing, they're not going to help solve this kind of a problem. And as we, as we compensate for our environmental impact from our past actions, if we could put a real dollar value on that, because that's a language that most Americans can relate to, and, and give it equal footing because it feels to some people like, and we also have to do this, and it's the it's silent value that's hugely important, but 
most people and for business to follow this, it has to be a business proposition. I'm not nearly as articulate on the philosophy side as Chuck, but I think that's one of our problems. We haven't given it the same footing to make sure, and that's why finding ways to engage everybody around what the problem is, they can see themselves helping to solve it, would be very helpful. We have time for one final question. Oh, you're going to let me. Okay, we have time for two final <laughs> questions. How's that for adapting? Hey, uh, thank you. Um, following up on the concepts of new technology and methodologies, I am wondering what efforts have been put forth to research or access um, new water technologies, and such as, uh, as Senator Wachowski said, atmospheric water or primary water that's in the magma of the earth. And it's as if people, I don't know if people remember when the um, earthquakes happened in Napa in the last year, and there was like two or three springs that just came out of nowhere that had never existed before. And there is water that's considered in the magnitude of many times um, the water in our oceans now that is um, known to be down in the magma of the earth. And apparently it's not that difficult to access, and I just am wondering if there has been any effort to um, bring some of that kind of water into the system so that we can help to supplement the surface water and the fish um, issues. Good question, Chuck. I'm not aware of those two examples specifically. We did talk about cloud seeding earlier in the session, but those examples are not too different from what's happening in the state right now in the context of looking westward and pondering whether you can use salt water through desalination to add water to the overall water balance. I mean, it's, it, that's a different example, but it's the same uh, theme. It, would it be useful or could it be, could it be something that oh, could a, be helpful? Do you mean desalination? Well, uh, desalination seems like it would be a little more difficult because you'd have the transportation, but some of these other um, technologies could be more in place for where the water is actually needed. I'm not, I'm not qualified to say about exploiting fractures in geologic sense for water, but I'm not qualified. To. Would Would you want any additional information, or would that be something of use? Okay. Talk to us afterwards. We'll okay, thank you. To carry it back. Sarge, I guess you get the Yeah, so I'll, I'll finish. Questions. By the way, Chuck, I'm Sarge Green, and I'm on the Water Quality Monitoring Council, and Randy was actually channeling my mantra about data, data management. And so if the department is engaged and, and needs to be part of the process. But actually, I've worked on groundwater most of my career, which is uh, I share your pain because it's the dark water science. We don't know enough about it still. We don't know how much we've got. Um, but the real question I have is, is I'm part of the Fresno State, and I, the whole thing of technology in the ecosystem field, uh, are we doing enough research? How can we help in terms of the practical side? The Coming up with the new techniques, uh, I see the military is here. What about Navy sonar, those kinds of things? I don't know, I'm, I'm just talking off the wall, but how can we engage the academic community? Better. <laughs> uh, I get in trouble with staff for doing things like this, but I think it would be an interesting thought experiment on a regular basis. Our department of scientists sat down with like a collection across the UC and CSU system and like annually you said, hey, we're seeing this over in the field that's an interesting hypothesis. We'd like you over on the research side to take a look at it. You're going to run into the problem. Each side will say to the other, who's got the money? But I find that if you've got the right idea or thing to look at, then you worry later about how you pass the 10 cup around to fund it. And, and I have the opportunity working with the Delta Science Program to work with a, a number of academic centers throughout the, the Western US and receive information uh, along those lines. But more frequently, and I, I wish that I could expose uh, all of the other agencies related to water and ecosystem to the, the, the resources that we have available at the Delta Stewardship Council. It's becoming more evident 
And recently, we, uh, Chuck and other agency leaders identified a key staff person in their shop to work together in a workshop environment to identify the highest priority, near-term, high-impact science needs. This group, since February, has developed a list of 10, and, and since May has begun to implement those. It's an incredible, um, it's incredible movement. And the, the consensus among the 17 people that were gathered together across state and federal agencies said, we never get to interact with each other. We never get to have these kinds of conversations, and it is bearing a lot of fruit. And so now if you extend that same approach to UC Davis and UC Berkeley and University of Idaho and, and where all the knowledge centers are, we've got, we've got some great resources ready to deploy. We just and what, to organize. what you get is this kind of stuff, which maybe by way of conclusion, I'll try to knit together some things. <clears throat> There's a lot going on, but we can do better. Here's an example of better. So this administration's you know, leading an international discussion on climate change, right? And as a result, this building right here is home to our Air Board, which is trying something nobody else is. And because of y'all's support and others, including the legislature, there's a process to allocate the revenue from the auctions of these emission tradings. Turns out, a percentage of that revenue comes to my department. Turns out, if you restore degraded wetlands, you actually can sequester carbon. Wetlands are some of the most efficient carbon sequesters. Turns out, if you do that in the right places, you can actually get water quality and supply benefits. Turns out, you can also produce photoplankton for pelagic species which are faced with extinction in the delta. So, we just allocated a really big grant to UC Berkeley, a reclamation district, DWR. We're going to restore, I think it's about 1,500 acres in the delta to sequester carbon, restore wetland, produce waterfowl habitat, and water quality filtration benefit for food production and smelt. That's an example of where I think we've got to take all this stuff, and we've built into it monitoring so we can see if it's going to result in what we say it will five, ten years out. So hang in there. Go persuade the 15-year-old at home or in your neighborhood that they need to get in this field and help us out with the next generation of technology for the benefit of ecosystems. Couldn't agree more. Let's give a hand to Ava and Kyle for distributing the microphones. And thank you all for coming. I think the next session begins in about 10, ten, minutes. ten minutes.